that wasn't necessarily the aim. It was in answer to a um, request from the publisher Rizzoli, specifically Charles Myers, many years ago in the wake of a show I'd had at the MCA Chicago, and I think it was like 2006 or so, asking me if I, they wanted to produce an art book or I wanted to be involved in producing an art book about my stuff, which was, of course, flattering, and you know it's difficult to say no to such a kind offer. But at the time, I didn't really feel that I had enough work to make something like that viable. I wanted to finish building stories before that happened, so I did, and then decided to do it. And usually art books tend to be pictures of artwork that's in museums that mm -hmm. nobody else can see that's owned by private collectors, then interspersed with text by learned academicians or critics or something like mm -hmm. that. And I decided I wanted to make it much more personal than that. And on, on top of that, since my stuff is already available, I go out, I mean, the whole point of everything I do for the most part is to make things that are affordable and ownable by people and hopefully well made enough that it has something of the the sensation and care of art but also as disposable as the sort of things that you just might not feel bad about leaving behind when you move just because it's a pain to load them in the truck so it's making a book about that kind of thing is is a difficult balance so I ended up then writing I wanted to make it as personal as possible and so I wrote all of the cut lines and as direct a way as I could and talked as honestly as I could about what I was thinking or what was going on in my life when I, I made the particular things that I'm talking about in the book. And so the end result then is that it's kind of, it, I it didn't intend it this way, but I guess it looks like some kind of autobiography, which was not the intention mm -hmm. at all. But maybe, you know, I don't, I really don't want it to be seen that way, but it's, uh, I guess, you know, if you do something chronological and you're writing about yourself, it's kind of hard not to fall into that giant pit so is it hard for you to go back and look at that early stuff to to revisit it i was naive enough to think that it would be a fun way to relax at the end of the work day <laughs> and it ended up just being a torment and torture and i would do anything i could to avoid it but you can't say that to any other human being because you, you can't complain about working on a book about yourself like, or oh, about you know. being somebody who draws comics for a living Right. Yeah. It's, I mean, drawing comics is difficult enough as is and, yeah. and trusting oneself to get through a, a page from start to finish without the amount of time it takes to read a comic page is anywhere between 15 to 20 seconds. And that's, I don't know, there's a one to 1000 relationship, the amount of work time put into a comics page versus how much time it takes to read it. So most of my pages take about 40 hours or so. It seems like you're somebody who makes a very concerted effort to make a page that takes more time for somebody to read. Well, maybe not takes us more time, but at least shows some evidence of my putting care and respect mm -hmm. for the reader into it. I can't, I'm not, you know, I can't be responsible for how much time somebody might spend with something, but I at least don't want them to feel that I'm talking down to them or patronizing them or cutting corners or something, because there's enough of that in this world. So, But there's something to be said for a book that rewards rereadings. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's certainly the aim, definitely, is to try to make something that's dense and textured on many levels and isn't just a quick, breezy, you know, read through or something. So what was so painful about the process of going back? It's just, you know, reminding myself of all the stupid things I've done and said and regrets and seeing things that I thought were maybe not so bad and realizing really how not good they were and hmm. then sifting through things that I'd just trying to sort things out and you know and a lot of it is you know i'm sure there's reinvention in it i'm going back and looking at things that are 30 years old and i try really hard to remember what i was thinking and, go, and what was going on at the time but i'm sure that there's i mean all of our lives and memories are little tiny fabrications that then add up to a certain sense of ourselves that has got to be predicated on some major falsehoods so i'm I try very, very hard to maintain an allegiance to what I recall as reality, but uh, frequently, if I ask friends or relatives what actually happened, it might be glaring omissions on my part. So, Oftentimes, though, when, when we look back at things, uh, we put kind of a shiny veneer on it. We remember them better than they were, but you don't really seem to have that impulse. Oh, no, I have that impulse. Okay. Definitely, no, I've looked back on yeah. many things and, you know, polished up the edges and rounded the corners and things, so... And there, well, there's certainly been cases, too, where maybe I've thought, like, even in the case of just drawing a particular page, I'll generally, speaking, the ones I feel the worst about tend to be the ones that maybe are more interesting. Though hmm. not always. It's not, that's not a reliable rubric, but sometimes I'll draw ones that I feel okay about, and they'll end up being all right, too, but frequently I'll draw ones that are 
that I'll feel okay about and they'll end up being the worst things I've ever done. So is there anything that you can look back on and just feel not top to bottom, but overall extremely proud of? Yeah, you know what? I don't really think it matters how I feel about it, actually. Like, who cares? You know, I don't and really in the long run. I don't even care. Like what my emotional reactions to my stuff is just something I have to get over. But is it really part and parcel of the overall reality? No, it's just my internal um, physiology responding to input, you know, and I don't think in the long run it's really necessarily all that. Important. Sure. You're somebody who and you may or may not acknowledge this yourself, but you're somebody who is at the top of his own game and at the top of the game and has been doing amazing work for a long time. And if you can't very nice of you to say, Thank not you. trying to flatter you, I, I mean it honestly, but I think from an outsider's perspective, from the perspective of, you know, we were coming up the elevator and saw some younger folks coming in who were clearly going to the show today, that if you're not able to, as somebody who's doing a really great job of this is not able to sort of take a sense of, of, of pride or accomplishment in it. That's a, that's, it's a little depressing. I mean, yeah, I, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to, you know, yeah. bum anyone out with it or anything like that, but it's doing a book and trying to sort it all out is certainly an effort towards trying to see it a little yeah. better maybe or something. And also to sort out the things that were done possibly for compromise reasons, you know, like CD covers I did in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to include things like that because that's not art. That's a CD cover. You know, that's like designing a throw pillow or something. All that matters is trying to, when I write stories, is trying to create a, a sense of reality that that hopefully feels real and communicates some sort of emotion for the reader through the characters in the story. My yeah. own personal feelings about the artwork itself and my reactions to it are inconsequential and discardable. It's like the wrapper on a on a. You make that comparison in the book itself to, I mean, I think it was Jimmy Corrigan, which obviously more copies of that were made than anything that you've done. It was a really big breakthrough book for you. But then I think the point that you were making in, in an offhanded way was, you know, ultimately the, this is kind of disposable. Yeah. Well, no, definitely. I mean, it's, I've, said, I've said this a gazillion times, but the I, I cherish that relationship to comics as a visual art. They are a disposable art of reproduction that has a, a sort of indelible relationship with the reader of of unpretentiousness and um it's not something comics are not something that you necessarily have to worry about spilling something on or something happening to you, you can buy another one or if you get sick of it you can throw it away and, and as i've said if you go into a museum and you see a painting and you don't understand it you're you're more likely to blame yourself and your ignorance of the history of art than you are if you read a comic strip and you don't understand mm. it, you're just going to think you're going to blame the cartoonist. You're going to think they're an idiot. You just think, no, oh, they're a bad cartoonist. You know, what's wrong with this person? So I think that's really important. And I, I would like it if more people could go into museums and say, that's a really bad painter. I don't think he's very good. But there's a cloud of, of fashion notoriety and distance, I guess, to the fine arts that sort of protects it which is, it's really kind of important for it in a lot of ways for yeah. it to survive. And that goes all the way back to the the Renaissance and rich people funding portraits and the church and that sort of stuff, whereas the popular arts tend to kind of live on their own terms, which I think is really extremely important when it comes to actually communicating something honestly between artist and viewer, or writer and reader. So There's a sense that if something has survived for that long that there must be some value to it well that's absolutely true too but uh there's there's a certain amount of time where that has to you know cycle through where people just think like you know what i don't really like this yeah. actually can we put this in the storage room or something and then painters get forgotten but then they might get rediscovered again because somebody might see something in the storage room that's like wait that's beautiful what is that doing back there you know so i have this kind of a stupid idea of a of the of a way of, when I was in art school, we were always being asked, is it art? You know, I yeah. just thought, why are, we, why are we wasting our times asking questions like that? I feel like, okay, if the museum collapses and you're sifting through the rubble and you can't tell the difference between the rubble of the museum and the art, then it probably wasn't art to begin hmm. with. But if you can, you know, see something beautiful sticking out of a chunk of, you know, concrete and that moves you, then maybe that, maybe it really was art. So. Is it important to make that distinction? I mean, you know, you said earlier that a, a CD cover or something that you're doing basically as a, you know, a paid job is not art. So why even draw that line? Well, that's actually a very good point. Um, maybe it's not my role too, but I know that 
when you start from a certain impetus, at least as a cartoonist, mm. I'm starting with trying to communicate something within a story that's very personal. And by doing that story, I'm trying to get at and, and delve into something even more personal than I can imagine when I begin it. Doing a, a work for hire, which I haven't done in decades, basically, um, is a completely different thing. That's just trying to get something to answer to the requirements of a particular person or something and it's essentially it's just prostitution you know it's what do you want how long do you want it and here's my fee and i need to pay my rent please mm -hmm. you know so that's a very different thing i'm not saying that something accidental might come out of it sure. that's nice but it's highly unlikely that it's going to connect to the core of the human soul so in order for it to be really valuable in an artistic sense then it has to be something that you would at least theoretically do regardless of whether or not you were able to do it for a living Right, very good way of putting it. Yeah, I think, and I never thought that I would make a living doing any of this. I just thought I'd be like a weird guy shuffling around on the street with like tattered notebooks or something, you know, working on his graphic novel here and there in the corner, and then I'd die, and somebody would find it, you know, and think, oh, this is weird, you know, it wouldn't matter. So, but um, I'm shocked and deeply grateful that I've been able to to make a living at it in a, in a way that I never would have imagined. So are, are you still dealing with that sort of that imposter syndrome at, at an event like this or, you know, meeting with some of your peers or, you know, giving a speech on stage or accepting award, do you still feel out of place? Oh yeah. I yeah. mean, I think imposter syndrome is, it's just AKA reality yeah. for me. You know, I, I, I haven't slept continuously through the night for years. I wake up every night around, 2.30 or 3 or so just in a sheer panic with my mind racing about all of the either the dumb things I've said or that I have to say or or do or feel wrong about or it's I don't I don't know how to get past this point but usually it settles down after a yeah. couple of hours but then I'm left thinking like is that the reality of life is that those those two hours of you know staring into oblivion and thinking these things is that what life is actually because once I'm up and around and actually moving and trying not to bump into walls and you know the sunlight is falling on me that stuff seems kind of in the background or something so is it maybe I don't know I can't tell which one is actually the reality and which one is the the falseness yeah but I don't know I've found for the most part that people who don't suffer that to some degree are probably not people I would want to spend any time with. If you have really? full confidence in what you do, you're probably not very fun to hang out with. Well, that's nice. That makes me feel better. So, <laughs> Well, I mean, from a personal standpoint, one, I mean, you know, obviously uh, cocky people just aren't fun, but, but mm -hmm. also from a professional standpoint, doesn't that self-drought, self-drought, doesn't that self-doubt? <laughs> I've got to use that. Yeah, that's that was, pretty, that was a pretty good slip up. Yeah. But doesn't that drive you to some degree? To, uh, to yeah, do definitely. Yeah. I mean, especially when I was younger, I thought if I just keep working, I'm going to get past this and I'll be like one of those people that I see walking around who has this magic thing called self-confidence mm -hmm. and I'll, I'll reach that pinnacle. I'll get up to that level on a plateau or whatever metaphor you want to think of. And it never happened. And yeah. I think people who feel self-confident and aren't plagued by doubt just are that way and they're going to be that way until the end. And I'm not that way. And but do I'm they push themselves way. the same way? Probably, I think, you think so. so? Okay. Yeah, I mean, it just they're just different people. Yeah. Maybe they're, and I don't know whether it's an advantage or a disadvantage. They're just different types of people and different, you know, I, I'm not sure what the evolutionary advantage is of having one or the other or what inculcates it, whether it's we're born with it, whether we're wired that way or whether we learn it based on our upbringing or situation. Um, it's obvious, probably a you know, both. You're able to see your mistakes, learn from your mistakes, and at least theoretically get better from them. And, and with which each subsequent book, I assume, try to do better than the last. Yes, definitely. That's, that's, yeah, that's yeah. what keeps me going. So that's, so yes, you're right about that. This idea of comics as, as ephemera, as disposable, as, you know, kind of pulp fiction, has that changed at all over the last couple of decades? You know, now that it's getting that sort of recognition, is it not disposable in the same way that it once was? I mean, you use the word pretension that there's maybe something inherent in the medium that leaves that pretension behind, but that does seem to be changing a bit. There, there are plenty of pretentious comics out there now. Yeah, it seems to me like there's really, at least in our small corner of the world, of trying to draw comics that are serious, not the yeah. not that not that the superhero for adults comics aren't. It's a different kind of serious. serious. Yeah, it, to me, but it's a seriousness that doesn't really make yeah. sense. It's like akin to writing 
as I've said before, like pornography for children. It just doesn't make sense. You know, it seems like I don't, but okay. You know, there's obviously we're on the very far losing end of it. I don't, you know, it's not like we're going to yeah. take over from the, the superhero world, which is vastly more popular and always will be. And that's the great. The novelty fine, library so. cinematic universe is not uh, <laughs> coming into it's the in picture no danger of, <laughs> yeah, which is, I, you know, that's fine. But I think there's something in in the comic medium it's i mean there's a there's a there's a direct relationship between image and story in comics that the story devalues image and because of that i think the reader senses the fact that the as is they're reading through something that the images that they're looking at are disposable literally disposable mentally mm -hmm. disposable as you read through them they they vanish just as quickly as our own experience of the present vanishes into whatever it is direction the wake of our consciousness or something so in a way i kind of think that's it's kind of a an honest or not necessarily honest but it's sort of a congruent 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 i think that's the word i want metaphor for the way we actually experience the world so it's throwaway quality kind of mirrors the way we we experience things. I don't know. I mean, socially, again, just being printed on crappy paper and stapled and sold for a few dimes in the corner of 7-Eleven, at least that was my history of it. That's, you know, that also has its own advantage, too. So. You're not describing your own comics when you talk about those sort of pulp floppies. I mean, these are, your new book was shipped to me this week and it, <laughs> it came in this giant box. It was, you know, I think it sits somewhere in the neighborhood of about nine pounds. It's, yeah. you're, you're making, uh, you no, know, no, you don't have to grimace. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying it's, it's, it seems like you're going out of your way to make something. And this was like always Art Spiegelman's thing, right? Is make a make a book with a bookmark, comic book. Yeah, with a bookmark, make make, right? make but make the object itself worth having. Oh sure, I definitely want to do that, but still, it's you know, it's a far cry from a from a book that costs, I think you know, sixty dollars and much cheaper on Amazon, and then doing a painting that costs a hundred twenty thousand yeah. dollars that only one person is going to own. You know, every anybody can have a copy of this, and they're all going to be the same. Which is, I'd want to make something that definitely has, and certainly with building stories, I tried to do something that was, that had the sense of art and the sense of texture to it that, that fine art has, but with a, an affordability and an accessibility that hopefully allowed for many more people to have it. But I wanted to make it something you would want to keep, but that doesn't mean that you still can't just junk it if you're tired yeah. of it, you know? So it, maybe in a sense it's more disposable, but when you talk about the inherent value of art, they're really not that there's any money means anything, but, mm -hmm. but the value that's ascribed to art isn't obviously inherent in the art itself. And mm -hmm. like you said, a museum can collapse or a fire could happen and that original is gone. Right. But yours, it's going to take a lot more a lot more bad things are going to happen on earth for Jimmy Corrigan to go away. Oh, geez. That's really a horrible way of thinking about it. Actually. No, that's I mean, like, no, it's, it's pervasive, but in, but in a, in a good way. Yeah. And thought about that. It, it, it reaches it, you know, only so many people will go to MoMA or the Louvre and, mm -hmm. and when they do, they're going to see something and, and interact with it. I have this thing. I don't come from any kind of a fine art background. And, and as a grown up, I've tried to get better at it. And <laughs> I have this thing where I go to a museum and I stand in front of a piece of art, even if it's one that I like, even if it's like a Van Gogh or something that I really appreciate. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I'm trying to figure out what the right amount of time to spend right, is yeah. and like how this is supposed to be impacting me. Yeah. It's a weird sort of scrim you have to try to tear through, isn't it? I feel the same way. Yeah. I do the, exactly the same thing. And I think like, okay, when am I going to feel something? I might, oh, wait, I'm not paying attention. I'm paying more attention to that person over there who's wearing those weird pants, you know, and then you look back at the painting and you think, okay, I'm really going to focus now. I think that's really the way we experience most of life. And you, yeah. your emotional reaction to Van Gogh, one of my favorite paintings of his is just his painting of his room with those weird, you know, glowing colors on yeah. the, the horrible accusatory furniture that's in there. But I didn't think of those things when I was looking at the painting. Those things came back to me in my memory. And I think most great works of art don't work in the present. They work in the memory. Well, you, you're, they're... you're hitting on something really interesting. And this was something that I wanted to circle back to when you were talking about comics is the idea that in comics, artwork supports the text, but it does in the reading, but does it in hindsight? What are the things that really impact you when you go back and remember, you know, Black Hole, for example? Mm -hmm. is, is it the text mm -hmm. or is it the visuals? 
Well, I think, I mean, ideally in comics, the experience of reading a comic should be something along the lines of implanting faults or the experience of experiencing life mm. and that the end result of it will be the implantation of false memories in one's mind or of, it's a very difficult thing to sort out. I mean, I think, I think a filmmaker like Stanley Kubrick was really concerned with things like that. It wasn't necessarily the experience of his films, but the particular scenes that were really hang in your in your memory yeah. and just sort of stay there and i think dan Klaus is very attentive to that in a way that really no other cartoonist mm. is and he will even draw things in a certain way especially in his more recent work that's very uncomfortable or strange or he's i know he's looked at comics by cartoonists that are might be considered awkward or almost naive just as a way of making an image that has as i think of it personally as hooks that hang in your brain and stay with you so um yeah, it's a, it's an interesting question, and it's one that I was never was never brought up when I was in art school. Never talked about how art works in the memory. It was yeah. always how it worked, either in at the moment or in worse in the marketplace, which is something you should never think about. But it really is that's where it exists, and that's where we carry. I mean, that's where we carry everything. That's where we carry our lives. Our lives don't exist anywhere except in our memories, and art contributes to that is it potentially more powerful if that sits in the middle of a narrative i think so i mean a narrative in a painting you know it, it's either what you project onto it or what you know about the artist's life mm -hmm. or what you know about the particular story say if you're looking at you know liturgical painting or something yeah. like that i think the history of 20th century art is pretty much the attempt to jettison narrative in painting art uh, spiegelman understands this stuff much better than I and points to the particular art historians who were instrumental actually in trying to separate narrative and text from images. And so in a way, comics is sort of an attempt to bring those things together. Yeah. The painter Philip Guston was very concerned with that too and just was very insistent that what had been lost from paintings was a sense of story and storytelling. And that's what he really, really liked in paintings as a kid. And he actually had the guts to push against the the prevailing attitudes of the time in the 60s and 70s where that was just like the one thing you really just couldn't do for one reason or another and to do these works that are now some as far as i'm concerned i mean the only painting i ever teared up in front of was a philip guston painting mm. it's the only painting that's ever deeply moved me so there's something there i mean this is how we understand our lives is trying to create stories to remember things about our lives this is what it's all about this is what the mind is for and this is why i think we read fiction as a way to try to sympathetically understand how to do that and see how other people have done it it's not a prescribed direction that's not why you read fiction to say oh that's how i'll do it from now on it's just it provides a sort of sympathetic rudder or 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 tone i guess or something against which you can sort of harmonize yeah. your life because i notice when i'm not reading novels or fiction my life seems very choppy and kind of brittle and and awkward but when i'm reading novels i find that everything seems to flow maybe a little bit more easily or i'm not quite as anxious or there's something in it hmm. i mean, linda berry is very good talking about this stuff and talking about what she feels is almost the biological importance of story how we crave story how there's actually like a an actual physiological need for narrative which i she can articulate much better than i can so. you definitely seem like somebody who is more invested in tone than a lot of other people that you bring a, a very specific feeling to a text that you want to achieve and that in a way might be the most overarchingly important thing that you're working toward of what I was frustrated by as a young cartoonist in my 20s was trying to figure out a way of communicating the sensation of reality in life as I experienced it mm. in a medium that up until that point was suited really only to loud banging and crashing, really. Like, you know, it really was a medium suited to telling jokes in a loud way, like yeah. yelling in your face. An actual automatopoeia in many cases. Right, yeah. And looking down into things that, it, it, that characters having things done to them rather than looking at characters... Who are actually doing things and it was the first of all the the artwork of, of frank king who did gasoline alley mm -hmm. who drew in a very straightforward bold way but still managed to somehow create a sense of the more gentle flow of life and then also jerry moriarty who is a artist who lives in binghamton new york and did strips in uh, raw magazine 
called Jack Survives um, in the 1970s yeah. and 80s and worked in an incredibly bold, punctuated way, but still managed to create these these little vignettes of gentleness that I still don't understand. They're still, I mean, they're, they look to me like they're the comics of tomorrow, but they're decades old. And he's such a, a such a, he, he also was the only painter I can think of who actually did successful sequential paintings. And he's devoted the last few years of his life to doing uh, strips and stories about memories of his parents and inverting the ages of the parents relative to him. So he's an old man and his dad is a young man looking at him. And now he's moved back into his childhood home and is doing stories about these things in the house that he grew up in. So he's, I think he's one of the great artists of our time. How visual is the process of working through a story? It's 101%. Do you have those vignettes? Do you have those scenes in mind? Mm -hmm. Are you trying to basically connect those dots when you're laying out a story? When I start a page, I have a vague idea of how I, what image I'm going to begin with or what feeling or what memory I'm going to try to put on the page. And as soon as I draw it, whatever I thought I was going to do next almost always is thrown out the window and the drawing that I've done has suggests something much more interesting or reminds mm. me of something that's happened to me or seems or connects even more strangely connects to something that I'd drawn weeks or months earlier in the story that I'd forgotten and my mind was keeping track of without me being aware of so the story goes in a completely different direction I mean comics will write themselves if you allow them to that's always been the most pleasurable and rewarding part of writing for me is when those seemingly dissonant things connect mm -hmm. together you feel like you're really onto something right when you've taken two completely different ideas and effortlessly they just come together that's what it's all about yeah. i mean it's all up here anyway our brains are really super organized if you just trust it yeah the role of the artist is not to try to cram ideas into an existing structure but to allow that structure to form itself organically to allow those ideas to happen naturally so things are changing on age, but how dramatically is, is the story changing overall? Sometimes very dramatically. Sometimes something might occur to me that's been hidden in the background or a character that I've been ignoring mm -hmm. comes to the forefront and ends up controlling it in a way that's very surprising. It's the way dreams happen. It's this things are buried in your consciousness. Memories are buried in your memory, which is a tautology, but it's true uh, that come to the fore when you're sorting through your recollections that reform them and restructure them in a way based on things that might have happened to you that day or recollections that you're having or misremembrances of things that have happened to you. It's a baffling, inexplicable alchemy that I can't put my finger on. But I, I really think comics kind of capture that in a way that's more personal and direct than any other art form I can think of. Those are the moments that work best in, in fiction are the ones that you can't really deconstruct. Mm -hmm. It's that whole thing of you're able to do what you've wanted to do for a living. You know, I'm, I'm able to work in and around, you know, comics and musicians and I write for a living and, it, mm -hmm. and it's great. And I've, all I've ever wanted to do is write for a living, but there is that thing of some of that magic going out of it once it's actually your job and yeah. if you maybe if you approach things too academically maybe it loses the magic that makes fiction work so well well i mean when you were in school and when i was at school i'm assuming your english teacher yeah. at some point said okay we're gonna write a paper about this or that you need to figure out what you want to say and you put that up at the top and then you have three paragraphs that that support that and then you have your conclusion i mean what's the point of doing that that's just that's like that's like baking a cake backwards or something you don't do that you don't or like yeah. tasting the cake before you've baked it it doesn't make any sense you need some sort of formal structure when you're starting out right you need to kind of i don't know no i don't know i mean i don't think what do you tell kids how to play you say all right you know yeah. like here's your doll now this is the protagonist and this will be the supporting character over here. Now they're going to need to do that. You just sit down and see what happens. And that's, I guess it's just easier when you're teaching a class of 30 kids to have some sort of structure for yourself. Yeah, especially if you're trying to meet some sort of test rubric or yeah. something like that. Yeah. But I, I, I mean, and I think that immediately kills writing yeah. for kids because it takes away the, the main reason that we write, which is discovery. And writing is thinking and thinking through the same way the drawing is sitting down at a page and seeing what happens. But ultimately that must 
be incredibly frustrating sometimes. You can't just sit down and have it develop into something great. Sometimes it's not going to work out. Do you, sure. You just throw it away. Do then, you scrap yeah. a lot of stuff? Sure, I scrap a lot of stuff. Yeah. And I mean, it's not. I'm not saying that I don't have ideas or I don't have plans or I don't have notes. I do. Yeah. I mean, I know that Zadie Smith works this way. There's a, maybe it was her, but I don't think it was a writer who tried to make the distinction between structuralists and for lack of a better word, I mean, improvisers or yeah. something. I think of it as architects and gardeners. And everybody assumes I'm an architect, but I'm more of a gardener, which is ironic because in real life I, I kill everything I touch. And I think I understand architecture better. But there are certainly writers who do work within a very specific way of gridding things, you know, setting things out. These are the characters. This is what's going to happen. And they fill it in. That's just the way their brains work. And that's fine. And not saying one is better than the other, but I don't think that one should, should completely discard the idea that you can allow things to develop and discover things in your mind that are yeah that are already in existence. Because you're gonna dis there's no way that you can sit and think about something and come up with more interesting ideas than the ones you're gonna come up with when you're actually working. Otherwise, what's the point of working? But the appeal of improvisation from an outsider's perspective is this idea of effortlessness, right? Really? That seems like, it seems like the most horrible, fraught with anxiety effort that you could possibly have. The other way seems so much safer to me. But it, the irony is, is that you're still improvising. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Even if you're building the structure, that still has to come from some sort of creative moment. It's not like it, it's just there and you're creating it. It's still going to change as you work on it. And it's up to you whether it's while you're working on it or while you're thinking about it and why it can't be a blend of the two or more one or more the other. This isn't something that's that's analogous across mediums, really, like sitting down and drawing a comics page, I assume is different than playing a free jazz trumpet, for example. It's not. I it's don't not? Think, I don't, at least in my case and some yeah. other people's cases, I don't think it is that. I think it's actually more analogous to composing music than anything. I can't make these broad generalizations necessarily, but the, uh, in the few times I've tried to write music Hearing it is as much a part of yeah. writing it as is, as the you know. So as you hear it, then you think of other things that might sound better or work better, or you try something and it surprises you and it takes you somewhere else. So playing something live in the studio or playing something live on stage, there's less of an overall commitment to it, right? I mean, you you, you do it, you put it on record. When you do something like your work, you know, if you're talking four or five, six hundred pages, you're committed to that for an <laughs> extremely long amount of time. And if it fails or doesn't go where you want to go and you have to scrap it, you've just lost an incredible amount of time. Right. Well, I mean, I think what you're getting at there is the difference between performance and composition. Mm. And I think a lot of what we think of as the popular arts well certainly music has kind of headed towards the realm of performance whereas yeah. music very much used to be a composed art and that's one of the things that appeals to me about comics is that it's very much a composed art it's an it's an effort of deliberation and preparation rather than immediate performance even though that there is that degree of i you know i can't think of a cartoonist as a performer that sounds disgusting but um i think you know what it i mean so, pornography ultimately yeah, doesn't oh it? god no um <laughs> maybe the closest to performing is is that um is doing work for hire yeah maybe i think i don't know i yeah. mean it's still composition i mean the, the music that i value most is is tends to be the music of composition not yeah. necessarily of performance and the thing about comics is that well, the music that I really like is is not the the emotion that comes from the music that I am most moved by is not necessarily due its performance. You can screw up well written music through bad performance, mm -hmm. but even the best written music can still move you, even if it's performed badly. There's something encoded yeah. in there. So, and I think there's something along, certainly with writing and with comics, both there's something analogous there but in a sense the performance of that is often as important as the, the composition itself i mean there's a difference between Sometimes. sitting down and listening to two different people play box something will something will potentially move you a lot more than another one possibly yeah but it's certainly bach is a good example because this is a music of almost pure composition yeah in a way so you could play that music on on you know, tune triangles or bottles and still be moved by it. It would yeah. still have a clarity and a, and a purity and attentiveness to the structure of, of reality that a lot of music doesn't have. So it's not, it's not based on a theatricality. So do you ever wish that your work was more effortless that you were able to just sort of, I mean, are you, are you envious yeah. of people who seem to, it just kind of pours out of them? Yeah, maybe. I admire that, I guess, but it just doesn't suit me. I mean, I used yeah. to draw much messier and without planning, and I finally came to the conclusion that just wasn't. It certainly didn't suit 
trying to write comics fiction, which is a synthetic concern, yeah. making something that doesn't, it's not real, seem real. So it suits my aims more when I'm writing comics fiction to do it in a way that is, is again, for lack of a better word, synthetic in the same way that we put things together in our mind. But when I'm trying to remember something and I write my diary, I draw in a very loose, wiggly way because I'm trying to find a, the memory and it's about my own experience, not about creating a fictional experience. You have put out multiple sketchbooks and and there is this this big new book out which shows some of the earlier stuff. So it's not that you're trying to avoid showing how much work goes into it or that you're not necessarily ashamed of the failures or the, the ideas that didn't quite work out. Mm -hmm. Right. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I think it's very important, actually. Yeah. I mean, I mean, think of any, you know, I don't honest to God know who would be interested even in a book like this. If, if I was thinking of anybody when I was working on it, it would be young cartoonists who yeah. might care. And I don't certainly don't expect, you know, there's probably only a handful of young cartoonists who would even be interested, whereas a lot of them would just be, I don't want to read that guy's stuff. He's something wrong with him, you know. I, as a young cartoonist myself, I was constantly coming up against all sorts of barriers that I didn't expect, both aesthetic and social and personal. And I just tried to write about them in as honest a way as possible so that if other younger artists are coming up against the same thing, it might be a little helpful or something. I don't know. Just the sort of thing I, I hope that I, I wished I'd had when I was younger, yeah. trying to figure things out, you know, and that I only figured out from either working on my own or, or having conversations with like Charles Burns or Art or Gary Panter, any number of encouraging older cartoonists. It's important to know that it's not effortless, that somebody banged their head against the wall a lot and had yeah. a lot of failures in order to get there. Otherwise, when you're first starting out, it, it's a lot easier to give up if you think you just don't have what it takes to get there. Yeah, I, it definitely requires a lot of, of <laughs> free time and yeah. uh, antisocial sort of uh, pre your sort of uh, pre-existing condition of antisocialness. So you know, we we talked about having self out even up up to the stuff you're doing now. But was there ever a point where it was so overwhelming that you thought you just weren't going to be able to make comics, or that you weren't good enough, or that you couldn't make it? Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, I still feel that way. I guess a better way of phrasing it is, did you ever consider just scrapping it? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, I consider it all the time, still to this day. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, um. But there's a way I, I had a certain, I think it was having that daily deadline when I was a, a student working for the, the student newspaper at the University of Texas. That kept me working hard on what I was doing and getting past my self-doubts just simply because I knew yeah. I had a space I had to fill. That made me try all sorts of ridiculous things that I would otherwise never have tried or avoided or just simply not even sat down to work. So without that, I'm not sure I would have yeah. ever been able to do it. And I think the amount of time it takes for the average reader to read a comic strip again versus the amount of time it takes to draw it for the young cartoonists starting out i think they're just overwhelmed by that when they see it they think it doesn't take very long at all my daughter is even be very disgusted with me when she'll come upstairs after i've been working on a page for a couple of days and she'll say daddy is that all you've done in the last <laughs> two days i could have finished that page in an hour yeah and then she'll take a piece of paper and just start writing it but then she'll say well this is, takes a little longer than yeah. i thought but still you could work faster come on you know so yeah, wouldn't it be nice if the pictures in her head just found yeah. their way onto the page that they yeah. never heard at all. Maybe she's right, though. I yeah. don't know. There are cartoonists whose work time versus reading time is definitely a bit of a, a less impugning uh, proportion than mine is. So. Is there a part in the process that, that is purely enjoyable? I talk to musicians about this a lot. Mm -hmm. For many of them, like, the writing is laborious, like they don't like performing live. Mm -hmm. It may be that moment when the album comes out, either because, hey, here's a, a document of what I've done, or thank God it's finally behind me. But there is right. like a moment where it's like, okay, well, this is why I do this, and this is why I couldn't possibly do anything else. Yeah, I would agree entirely with that. That sort of tangible yeah. experience of having something finished and working on it for a long time, That is, there's a true... 48 hours or so yeah. satisfaction there, I guess, that would qualify as what would be maybe possibly optimistically termed enjoyment, but um, more just like a feeling like, well, there's nothing more I can do to it. You yeah. know, it's done. And that there's little moments of that too, like finishing a page. Once I finish inking a page, that usually lasts for a couple of hours or so of 
you know, a sense of, all right, you know, I'm done with that. But then I wake up the next day and it's like, oh God, I'm going to start another one. That's a real pain in the ass of publishing is uh, the, the, the space between finishing it and having it come out and touring on it is pretty lengthy and you've no doubt moved on to the next thing already. Yeah, I yeah, I mean, I try to work. I've been working on three different books at the same time for many years. So yeah. it's it's a way of shifting around. So I mean, I think you know everybody knows the stories of the artists who who um, go bad or lose track of themselves. And the you know the music world certainly is full of like, oh, the next album is out and it's not as good as the last. What happened? Yeah. You know what horrible thing? And I think every artist lives in fear of that happening and not being aware of it. Of it, like, how, when is this going to happen to me? How is it going to happen? How am I not going to be is aware? Going to drop it? right exactly. Like, and why? would it and it's the the terrible thing is that all of those uncertain deep black pools into which you have to to lower your feet and jump in at certain points simply to do what it is that you do as far as writing fiction or music or whatever it is are those same things that can swallow you up and deceive you i've sat at a drawing table working on something and realized that i've completely deceived myself for hours and made something that was nonsense while somehow something in my brain was telling me that it wasn't so how, and it, in the, that, that that might actually metastasize and take over one's mind and life and ruins oneself is what really terrifies me. Like, I just think, when, when will this happen? Is it, is, it, is it inevitable, or is it just happened to a few yeah. people? How does it happen? Why does it happen? I don't know, and I live in fear of that. So whenever I finish a page and I have that sense of satisfaction and then I have to start another one, I think, is this the one? Is this the one where I'm going to lose it and I'm not going to have? I'm not going to be myself anymore. So I don't know. It's nice though when the sun really literally does rise again the next day when you realize that you got back to sleep and that you're able to move on from that. Yeah, but not really because there's no certainty involved. I don't have the, you know, I don't know. Yeah, sorry. There you go, that was Chris Ware. I actually recorded that one in his hotel room in Brooklyn before Comics Art Brooklyn. Obviously, he's somebody that I've been trying to get on the show for a really long time, and we just never really managed to cross paths. As you know, I do all of these in person, so a relatively rare appearance by him in New York City promoting his new book, Monograph. It's on uh, Rizzoli International Publications. It's 208 pages. It's gigantic, and it's uh, absolutely gorgeous if you're a Chris Ware fan, which I assume just about all of you are. I highly recommend that you pick that one up. Uh, Thanks to him and thanks to Eric Reynolds for helping facilitate that interview. There's really a a whole bunch to um, unpack here. I, you know, just finished editing the show so it always gives me a chance to go over an an interview that I had done some months ago and kind of, you know, re-examine what we were talking about. And Chris has a way, and he I mean, he does this in his work as well, obviously, but he has a way of really just laying himself bare. There's nothing it seems that he won't talk about when it, it comes to the creative process and um, for better or for worse, he's completely brutally honest about it. If you're an aspiring cartoonist, that's probably something of a mixed blessing. When you hear somebody talk about some of the frustrations that they have with their work with regards to creating it and going back curating it, looking at stuff that he had done years ago, as, as is the case with the monograph book, I, I get the sense that it probably gives you a little bit of, of hope in that, you know, even where who is easily one of the most brilliant cartoonists of our time still runs into all these frustrations while he's creating (laughs) but at the same time it's probably a little bit frustrating as well to know that in a sense to kind of turn a popular internet meme on its head uh, things don't necessarily get better if you are somebody who struggles to create those those struggles might just follow you around for as long as you're doing it but uh, there's something obviously in him that drives him to create the work and we're very lucky to have him and very lucky that he's continuing to create some of the uh, the best comics of our time with just a absolute consistent track record that we rarely see in this, this art form. So thanks so much to him for taking the time to do that. Thanks to you guys, as always, for listening to the show. I am recording this in the eye of the Bombo Genesis and in, in the eye of the uh, Cyclone Bomb is currently hitting New York City. It feels appropriate to be doing this at this time to be posting a conversation with a Chicago artist and and be complaining about all the snow that we're getting up here. Wanted to get this one up a little bit earlier, though. I am flying out to Las Vegas. God help me for a week for work, so I wanted to make sure that this was out there. And I wanted the first episode of of 2018 to be a big one, and, and I'm 
I, I think this is, in fact, um, one of one of my top RIY episodes. So thanks to you guys, as always, for listening to the show for the past 251 episodes. You're coming up on uh, five years, actually, in April, so that's kind of crazy. If you like the show, there are a bunch of ways to support us. You can rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. That really helps us when we're trying to get more high-profile folk like Chris Ware. Uh, you can like us on Facebook if you've got a little bit of cash to send our way Patreon is a good way to do that as well follow us on Tumblr that's rylcast.tumblr.com and uh, if you've got any feedback it's rylcast at gmail.com so thanks again everybody and stick around because we'll be back in uh, probably a little over a week at this point with another episode of RIYL <laughs>